Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes, and today I'm delighted to be joined by ex-Celtic defender Paul Elliott. Welcome to the show, Paul. Delighted, delighted, Paul. Great to uh, to be connected with you and obviously uh, all your listeners. Well, it was a, a real pleasure actually to watch you as a Celtic fan. Um, I remember the two seasons very well, Paul. And you've left your mark at Celtic Park. You're a very popular figure up here. I was uh, looking at your your previous career prior to Glasgow and uh, noticed that at Aston Villa you were already managed by Billy McNeil. What's your memories of the great man back in those days? I love Big Billy. I mean, he he was a great inspiration to me. And um, the truth is, you know, he was the the main reason, you know, why I come to Celtic. Um, I worked with him at Aston Villa, and you know, I think it was helpful, the fact that he was a, a colossus of a centre-back. So he was always very influential with me. And I, and I had a, a really good working relationship with him because in terms of coaching, it's always easier to be coached by somebody who's been a great centre-half in the position that you aspired to be. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, he managed me brilliantly, always full of encouragement, full of praise. Um, so obviously, when we... Uh, I went on to Italy in 1987... And then obviously he moved a year later. Uh, sorry, moved before then, actually. It was a wonderful way to reconnect with him back at Celtic. When you went to Italy, you joined a Serie A club, Paul, who were up against some of the best strikers in the world. What, what's your memories of the Maradonas and Ruth Hulett, Marco Van Basten? Listen, I, I, I mean, I was so honoured to go to Italy. I was only, I think I was 23 at the time. And it's hugely relevant, wasn't so much at the time, but more so now, that I was the first black English defender to go and play in Italy. Um, And that was a very long time ago. And I remember my debut actually was against AC Milan. And, um, you know, Rude Hullet was there. I was marking Rude. Van Basten was there. Frank Reichard was there. Franco Beresi was playing. Paolo Modini was playing. Carlos Ancelotti, the Everton manager, was playing. So... It was a wonderful uh, technical, technical, tactical, cultural environment to play in. And uh, let's just say, I mean, we got beat 3-1 actually against AC Milan. But you know what? <laughs> let's say I had, a, I had a busy afternoon marking Van Basten and Hullet, shall we say. But uh, okay. it, it, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. I was very, very grateful and very privileged. When the, the time finally came for you to, to leave Italy, Paul, what were your options at that time? I know you said... The fact that Big Billy was in for you was a massive factor in your move to Glasgow. Were, were there other British clubs involved in that? Yes. I, I mean, I was told at the time that West Ham were in for me uh, and also Nottingham Forest, um, which I thought was very interesting because uh, Brian Clough was there at the time. Um, and West Ham was, was, was an interesting move for me because obviously I'd been on the road for a little while. I mean, I left home, you know, my first club was, or, you know, a move away from London was David Pleat at Luton when I was 18, which was a great move that then in the first division in England. Um, so, I'd, you know, I'd done a bit of miles and I, and I was ready, you know, thinking to go back to London. But, you know, when I heard about Celtic, I had a kind of engagement with, with Celtic. Um, I thought, you know what, big club, big history. You know, I thought about, uh, you know, big Jock Steen and sort of 19, what, 1967 and all the history around Celtic. And going north of the border, you know, with Rangers, who were then in the ascendancy, I just thought, you know what? It's still in the United Kingdom, still in the British Isles. Why don't I go and, and, and give, it, give it a go? And, and what I'd done, actually, before signing, I spoke, you know, one of my best mates in football was Mark Walters at, uh, at Rangers. Mm-hmm. And uh, Wally, as we call him, I say to him, Wally, what, what do you reckon? And he says, big man, you know, get yourself up here. You know, it's a big place to play. Rangers are a big club. Celtic's a big club. It's a thriving, energising city. Give it, give it a go. He says, you're a young man. You're only 25. Peak, peak of your career. You know, come here for two or three years before you decide to go back to, uh, to England. So that's what I've done. Fantastic. What was your first impressions of the Scottish game, Paul? I know back then people thought it was a bit rough and tumble, a bit fast. What was your... Yeah, I mean, listen, you know, in Italy, the game was played differently because obviously there was always a, a slow, cultured build-up from... from in Italy and technically, tactically, you know, you had time, you could travel with the ball. I mean, my technical ability improved massively. But I think coming to, coming to Scotland initially, I was thinking I need an extra lung, to be quite honest with you. The, the game was at a ferocious tempo, back to front, and you're always constantly on the move. So it took me a while to adapt. Um, 
So, you know, I think that was my early impression that the game was played at a, a, a horrendous rate, a, a pace, really fast, high tempo, and it was very physical. But I had no problems with that. You know, like all these things, you could see when you look at the Premier League now and you're seeing our players, they do take time to adjust. Some players will take two years, don't they, to, to adjust to an environment because you've got the, not just the on-field, but you've got the social environment, you've got the cultural environment. And all those factors are, are very important times to take to adjust. But in the end, you know, once I got, uh, shall we say, acclimatized, and, you know, the, the, you know, at Celtic, they saw the best of me. And, mm. and it was, a, it was a, an amazing... I just loved the Scottish people. I loved the integrity. I loved the social values. I loved the humour. I loved the decency of what Scotland stands for. I mean, when you came in, Paul... The, the club had some success under Billy a couple of years before, but Rangers were dominating Scottish football at this point. Who impressed you in the Celtic dressing room? Who, who was the guys that stood out for you? Well, I mean, they were a great set of lads, but, you know, I'm thinking about Paul McStay, the hat. You know, I loved the hat. He was top-class player, top-class individual. Because mm-hmm. I remember reading about him when I was a lot younger, that Inter Milan tried to sign him. And I'm yeah. thinking, wow, into Milan. I remember it was for about four or five hundred grand. This was way back in his teens, which is a, was then an astronomical amount of money. So I always followed his progress. And, and I have to say, Darius Jakonowski, you know, me and him become really good mates. Yeah. And, and mm-hmm. I think he was an unbelievable talent, great talent, made football look so easy, wonderfully gifted player. And Darius Dobchak as well at left back. He was a really talented guy. But the hat, I've got to say, Paul McStay was a, he was a gentleman of, a, of an individual. I mean, we lived around the corner from each other in Uddingston. And him, I remember his wife, Anne-Marie, they, they always made me feel so welcome. And he had the most loveliest family as well. So the hat for me was, uh, was a top man. And I, and, and I really got to go on well with John Collins as well when mm-hmm. John signed from Hibs. He was a terrific player and a great lad as well. Yeah, some of the shining lights back in those days, certainly. You mentioned Jack and Oski, and obviously Jackie's finest moment, Paul, came in your European debut for Celtic. What a night. What a night that was. <laughs> oh, partisan Belgrade, wasn't it, yeah. you know? And, uh, and he scored all five goals, didn't he, you know? And we still went out on the, on the away goals. And that's when I realised because, you, you know, I remember the game so clearly and I'm thinking, we just lost all our discipline. You know, we've got both full backs charging on. Which, you know, and I'm thinking, calm down, calm down. You know, we, we you know, tactically... We were just all at sea that night and we got punished by it. But what a game for the neutral. I mean, uh, the game is, uh, is as clear in daylight in my head. It was a packed, packed to the rafters, wasn't it, you know, Celtic Park. And uh, Jackie was just unbelievable that night, scoring five goals and still not being on the winning side, you know, in, in, obviously in the aggregate score, of course. But uh, that was a game that just stuck with me forever and ever. A yeah, classic. It's just a shame we went out, unfortunately. I mean, a wee bit of tactical naivety, Paul, but... You were driven on by the Celtic fans, you know? Oh, the, the fans were just, oh. You know when they talk about the, the 12th man as the supporters? They were the 13th and 14th man on the, on the pitch. I've never felt such energy, such dynamism in a game, how a set of supporters could carry you along. And I felt it in so many of the games, but obviously in the big old firm games as well, what it meant to the supporters and the club. And the supporters were absolutely magnificent because... You know, I've travelled the world and I've met Celtic supporters in every part of the world, wherever I've been. I've met a Celtic supporter everywhere, in every the world. And uh, they were great human beings. And uh, I mean, I, I'm thinking back to Seville as well in the UEFA Cup, you know, when Celtic were playing against uh, in the final there in Seville. And, and I'm thinking to myself, these supporters are just on another level. I think the supporters, it's like a culture. It's a way of life. You know, it's, it's and their whole life is dedicated around the football club. And it's like similar to Liverpool in many respects and a lot of the great clubs. And, and that's when I realised what the club, the, it's an institution. That's what it is. It's an institution. And it's in the DNA of all the supporters' lives. And, and that's what makes you want to go out and just give 110% and more in every game. Oh, absolutely. You mentioned there, Paul, your old form games. I mean, back then, what did they live up to your expectations when you started playing against Rangers? They, they, they were massive. Uh, I mean, they, they were a huge game and I was very lucky because I, I think I had a fairly good scoring record in those games as well. I scored a couple of times, you know. Uh, we were, got beaten. I remember in the Skull Cup final as well at Hampden Park when I scored on one of the games at, um, at uh, Parkhead 
I remember it was a header from John Collins. I think that might have been in the in the cup round. I think it was like the fifth or sixth round of the of the cup. But there were huge games. There were huge games. And and you know, as you say, Rangers had the ascendancy. Um, I've got a lot of respect for Graham Souness. And and you look at them. I remember the you know I can remember as much as their team. I mean, obviously they were dominated by Anglo Scots. You had you know uh, uh, Chris Woods in goal. You had. Um, Gary Stephen right back. You had Trevor Stephen, you know, Brownie, Bomber Brown, you know, um, Goffey, Richard Goff, Terry Butcher, Terry Herlock, Mark Walters, Trevor Stephen, you know, Ali McCoyst, Big Mark Hately, Mo Johnston. That was more or less the team, wasn't it, you know? I remember strong it clearing side. my head. Yeah, Powerful strong, side strong that team. was. Absolutely. Really good side. And obviously a top-class manager as well in Sunes, you know. And I think I was different because I knew, you know, what had gone on, obviously, with the, the historical rivalry. But all those players, I played against them south of the border anyway in the first division then, you know, before, I, before my career started. So I knew them. I knew them well. And, and they're all very, very talented players. Very talented. You've got to give them credit as well. Oh, it was a strong, strong team, Paul. I mean, you, you mentioned a couple of goals you scored against Rangers. Talk us through your celebration. That was impressive in itself. I know. That was just my little jig, wasn't it? I, I, that was brilliant. I, I got that off the dance floor. In, I got that off the dance floor in Italy, to be honest with you. I'll tell you what, my hips and my back has not been the same since 30 years later. But uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> it was just brilliant. my little sort of celebrationary jig. And it was, I think it was just instant. It was just my way of uh, sort of connecting with the supporters, you know. And uh, I've, I've got to say to you, I, I, am, I am so honoured and privileged because I look back at my career and I've had a fabulous career. And, and my two years in Celtic, I, 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 I just remember it with so much fondness and affection. And of course, there were challenges, and I'm sure you'll come on to them later. But there was there was so much love there, you know, and, and respect that I had for those supporters. Definitely went two ways, Paul. I mean, see, after the season where we get to the Scottish Cup final, did you think, even though we didn't win that, we could build the following season? Did you still think Big Billy could turn it round for Celtic? Yeah, I mean, I mean Billy needed investment, and, and, and I think that's what Rangers managed to do. You know, they bought they bought well. Ultimately, it's about your acquisitions, isn't it? You know, your, your, your acquisitions make or break you, you know, but they bought well. And, and, and it's a shame, you know, a bit more patience. I mean, obviously, Celtic had a great model for developing their own talent. I mean, that was sort of one of the big legacies of the club, isn't it? From even the 1960s, isn't it? You know, yeah. the homegrown kids that, 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 that were sort of, you know, within a radius, a radius of 10 or so, you know, all local board. That was great. But, but that had to be supplemented as well by three or four, you know, ready-made players that could come in and do the job. So it's always about the balance of that, wasn't it, really? And it um, but yeah, I, I was. I, we're, we're hoping so, but but you know that's football, that's reality. You you, you know um, that's just how it goes, isn't it? And it was always great further down the line when I connected with Big Billy away because I met him a, a couple of times in in Scotland, and I met him in in, in I remember in um, in Monaco as well when he'd done the draw. So it was lovely to see him, and he and he recognised me instantly. We had big hugs, and you know it was great to see him. So I've got the utmost admiration for him. Not just as a, he's, he's a great defender, would he played seven, eight hundred times for the club, but he was a leader of people. I think he's, he was symbolic of everything great about Celtic and leadership and passion. Um, and, and he was a marvellous man, marvellous man. He once wrote, Paul, that he actually regretted not making you the captain during your two years at Celtic. Is that something that he discussed with you at some point? No, he didn't. Listen, I, I saw myself as a captain anyway. I didn't have to have the armband to be a captain, if you see what I mean, because I played like I was a captain. I played, was, played like a leader. But, you know, Billy knew what he got from me. He knew what he got from me every training session, every game. I could lead players, you know, be the leader in the dressing room because uh, we're all captains. And uh, I think my personality as well, I think that that was hugely significant. But, yeah, listen, it would have loved to have been formalised saying, Paul, you're my captain, or big man, he used to call me, um, Big Paul. But you know what, I, I saw myself as that anyway, you know, in every club that I played for. So, yeah, that would have been nice to have had that. But I think the Celtic supporters and the players saw me as a leader. And, and that, the respect of that, that was more important than having a captain's armband. Yeah. See, see in the first season, when you look at it, Paul, you, there was a lot of bookings at that time and it, it made uh, Celtic fans quite frustrated. About 16, I mean, yeah. I, I think one of the reasons was getting used to the tempo of Scottish football. Yeah, because it was very fast, it was very quick, and coming from that slow, methodical pace that was it in Italy. But then in Italy, the difference was in the last third of the pitch, the game was just played at this frenetic tempo because there was lots of movement. 
So it was the adaptation of that to bring that into Scotland. And then that's why I had to get used to the, to, to Scotland. And, you know, it was just a lot of the challenges initially were just mistimed because obviously I just had to get myself to a, a different level of fitness. I was fit, but it was a different level of fitness. I had to get myself to. Um, and, and obviously I got injured early, had an infection. And then obviously that wasn't helpful, you know, with my knees. And, and, and then once I got through that, got myself to a high level of the fitness that I expected of myself, then obviously, you know, I just peaked, didn't I, really? And I, and I think, you know, the Celtic supporters and the whole of Scotland saw the best of me. And I think that was obviously captured in winning the, uh, you know, the, 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 the Players' Player of the Year, wasn't it, really? Yeah. You know, and, and the first black man, the first black player to win that, the Scottish Player of the Year. And, and that's important. They were big, important landmarks because obviously that opened the, 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 the door for other black players to go there and, and, tr- and were treated so well, which is important. Absolutely. I mean, Paul, see, when you played in Scotland... Was it something that was in the back of your mind that it's maybe holding you back from getting some recognition in the England national team? It took until Alan Thompson um, for a Celtic player to be capped by England. Uh, Do you think that was maybe in the back of your mind that whilst you were in Scotland it might hold you back in, on an international level? It was a consideration, if I'm honest, Paul. But I, I don't think, because I knew at 25 I was approaching my peak and I think, mm-hmm. you know, at some point, you know, within a, you know, a two-year period, I know you know, I would want to go back down south to fulfil that aspiration. Um, and yeah, people can look at it playing in Scotland, you know, maybe not not getting the sort of the profiling. But I thought also that, you know, I looked at my old career as a whole, you know, and I was playing in the first division then at 18, which was, you know, very usually, you know, very few players at 18 would be playing regularly in, in, in the first division, you know, against your Chelsea's Aston Villas. And I've done that with Luton Town at 18, then done that at Aston Villa, straight into the first team at, uh, at 20. So, uh, so, and then, you know, playing at two years in Italy at, in the best league in the world at, at 23. So you see what I mean? I've, 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 I think that I'd done enough and, and merited enough on the back of what I'd done previously in football, but it wasn't meant to be. But I still looked upon it as two great, fantastic football years, playing in another league, an incredible league, you know, you know, against some really good sides. Aberdeen was still a very strong side. You, you know, Rangers obviously were, were the lead side. The Hibs derbies were very tough against Hibs and Hearts, you know. Dundee United were all competitive games. And I think, if I'm honest with you, I played in Scotland at a time when the Scottish League collectively was so competitive. The whole league was. It wasn't just about Rangers. All the other games were so competitive because it was their cup final playing against Celtic and playing against Rangers. So they'd all raise their game to another level. Oh yeah, absolutely, John. It was it was a completely different standard back then, without a doubt. You can see that from the terrace and, and the stands as well, Paul. I mean, see when, you, you know the Celtic fans were unhappy with the board. They were ousted three years after you left the club. Was there anything that could have been done to keep you at the club for a year or two longer? Um, to be honest with you, Paul, it wasn't about money because they offered me a really good contract. I remember then. But they knew it was about two things. One was aspiration to, to try and get in the, in the England squad because I knew, you know, my, 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 my ability merited that, to be honest mm-hmm. with you. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, it merited that. You know, I, I, I thought and I believed I was one of the best defenders in England over, a, you know, an eight, nine-year period. And as I said, having played in the first division then, which was then the equivalent, obviously, of, of the Premier League against all the top players. I'd done it at, at 18, Luton, Aston Villa, two years in Italy, you know, two years in Scotland. So I felt I didn't have any more to prove in that sense. And I was hitting my peak as a defender, you know, at 27 when I left and went to Chelsea. So it wasn't really about money. It was about my own aspirations to fulfil my own potential. And also as well, Paul, I'd been on the road a lot as well, you know, leaving home from sort of 18, you know, going all over. So maybe that was time to, to settle a little bit back in London as well. So I think that contributed, but it was more about a professional aspiration than a personal one. Sure. I mean, by that stage, Paul, you had you travelled, you'd seen the cultures in England, Scotland, Italy. and at that, Three countries. And, three yeah, countries. and no player had done that by the time oh, they're young. 27. At that stage, Paul, I know that your friend, your great friend, Mark Walters, had suffered racism up in Scotland. Yeah. What was your experience? Well, yeah. Uh, what was your experience overall? My, my overall experience was a great one, but I had my racism too. I suffered racism. I suffered that abuse. And, and there's a difference. It's important to realise, you know, some people say, oh, poor, you know, you, you know, 
it's sectarianism. And I'm saying, no, this is out and out racism. Mm. This isn't abuse of me by virtue of my religion. This is about the, my ethnicity, the color of my skin. And, I'd, and the truth of the, the reality is, Paul, I'd grown up with that. And by the way, let me be clear and make this clear on the record. This wasn't just in Scotland. This was also in England before I come to Scotland. This, all, this was also in Italy. So this taught me about racism. You know, I've always said you can't solve racism in football until you solve it in society. So this is about racism that was in society. And the supporters ref- reflect society, don't they? Yeah. So when I played at Charlton Athletic as a 16, 17-year-old in the first team, I suffered a lot of racism when we used to go up north and play in places like Newcastle, you, you know, in, you know, at Leeds, you know, all those challenging places north of Watford. I had the same when I was at Luton Town. I had the same when I went to Aston Villa. You know, had the same when I played in Italy. Had the same when I went into it went to Scotland, and had the same when I when I played at at, at Chelsea too. Mm-hmm. So that told me about racism. It wasn't confined to a particular. It was racism because that's what reflected what society was then, and still is now. You know, and you know, and I know that the events of the last three months has brought out so much more. So we're talking about structural and institutional racism, systemic racism. That's the fact. And of course, there's discrimination. People with disabilities, you know, people, you know, by virtue of their sexuality who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. There's obviously other forms of discrimination. But what we do know, that racism has been potent for several years, you know, in this country, in the United Kingdom, and all over Europe. That's fact. And that's where hopefully... The power of football, the power of a lot of good work that people are trying to do, a power of the work that I've done over, you know, over my last 25 years is contributing to make society and football a better place. You know, some great work that Show Racism the Red Card are doing up there in Scotland. So the great work that Fraser Wishart's doing that I know very well with the SFA, the Players Union. There's some brilliant work going on in Scotland. The SFA are doing some great work, you know. So I know there's a lot of good people. I've always believed it's people that make change, not policy. And Scotland are doing some brilliant work using the power of football. The players are great role models up there in Scotland. You know, and I've, I know my generation players, Mark Haightley, Coisty, Ali McCoyce, Mark Walters, you know, Neil McCann, you know, the players are doing some magnificent work and I, I applaud them. I applaud them. I salute them and keep up the great work north of the border. You, you retired in 1994 and what I was going to say is 26 years on, Paul, we should mm. be far more aware of these issues. However, the situation over the last few weeks, and I'm sure it will rumble on, has brought it right back to the fore and you ask yourself, has it actually got any better? I had a, a discussion, a very uh, in-depth discussion with John Barnes recently who told me yeah. that unconscious racial bias was a massive issue. Now, is that a difficult one to tackle, Paul, because a lot of people may not even know that they've got deep-rooted issues? Yeah, it's a valid point. I mean, I agree with a lot of what John has said, particularly around unconscious and racial biases. But like all these things, Paul, the real thing about if you're talking about addressing racism is kind of a bottom coming up, a top coming down approach. From the bottom is talking about education, mm-hmm. education of people and people for people to understand. There's really only one race. It's called the human race. And you could be black or white or you know, Catholic or Protestant. Or, but I know there's 100 years of history. You know, same now with people's understanding with people, black people. There's 400 years of, of slavery, 400 years of history. You know, I came to Scotland and understood more about the 100 years of sectarianism, you know, the, the rivalry between the clubs. So we're all about being educated. But I really, really believe that we are in a much better space. But COVID-19, what that's brought out has been the structural in- inequalities, the institutional inequalities. Um, you know, it's brought out the, you know, you know, the racial biases, the unconscious biases, because that's what happens in football. It's there in football because it's there in society. Yeah. And a lot of the football clubs are run by white middle-aged men. There aren't enough women. And there's enough talented women out there that should be inclusive in those balls. There's enough people from minority ethnic backgrounds who are very talented and be inclusive in those boards. But there's, a, there's you know, and that's why people have got to understand why, the, you know, the, the, the education is so important. 
Yeah. The you know I'm working on some big projects about equality of leadership. You know, uh, equality of opportunity in leadership positions. So the boardrooms, the executives, the senior management teams are reflective of the people of the participants. Mm-hmm. And it's so important. And, and John Barnes makes a lot of sense that you, you know, because everybody's got their biases. And the board that I chair at the FA, which is the, the English of A football, uh, 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 the FA Inclusion Advisory Boards, I hold the FA to account on equality, diversity, and inclusion matters. And one of the two best things that we've done was equality and diversity inclusion training for all of the staff on all of the boards and the committees, mm-hmm. and also unconscious bias training. We've done both. And the organization, the culture within the organization is much more effective and efficient for that training. And the diversity within the boards. We've got four women and two, one is from a black Asian minority ethnic community and myself as as a black man. So 50% of that board actually represents diversity. And as a consequence, the decision making is much more effective and efficient and the board is far more effective. And that should be the dollar now affecting all businesses, in all sectors, in the army, in corporates, across football, across businesses, across the judiciary, across the army. That is the model moving forward because there is a social and a human, but also an economic upside to a diverse and inclusive board pool. Oh, yeah. And, and there's only one human race. That's the message that we're trying to put across on, on the podcast as well, Paul. If, if you had a message for just a typical fan like me, what can we do better? as football fans when it comes to racial inequality or raising awareness of diversity issues in football or in society as a whole? I, I, yeah, I, I think it's one of these great... It's quite simple. When you look at somebody, be non-judgmental. You know, there's only... We are all basically the same. Mm-hmm. As I said, there's only one race. It's called the human race. And diversity is arguably the most powerful thing in this world, is diversity, is difference. Because if you look at all what's gone on in this crisis, what's, what's been the, the two most potent visual factors in the most extreme adversity in the last few months? I'll tell you my opinion, two areas. Number one, when you've seen all these wonderful young children and people do all these drawings of the rainbow, isn't it, of the NHS and put that in the windows. Mm-hmm. Look at all those colours. Those colours represent the diversity of the world. That's difference. So that's these kids looking through that. They're saying, these colours are beautiful. It's called the rainbow, isn't it? That's what represents the diversity of the world. And number two, when you look at all the protesters, there wasn't just black people. Black people were a minority. There were white people. It was multicultural, multiracial. It was representative of the world, the protesters. In the UK, in America, you know, all over various parts over Europe. It was representative of the whole world. So that's where the power of diversity is so key and so potent and so powerful. So I'm saying to somebody, there's only one race, it's called the human race. And the human race is made up of difference. It's made up of diversity. It's made up of different colours, different creeds, different religions. That's diversity. And that's the most potent visual aspect you could ever see and those two areas for me were the two most powerful things that has come out of that black is no mon- no longer a minority the diversity is the king and the power and that's been reflective in what's gone on that that has inspired me beyond comprehension and words it is it's inspirational your words are inspirational as well paul and yeah. from a celtic fan from a celtic fan i speak for a lot of fans uh, who listen to the podcast uh, by saying that you are you're one of these guys in my era, Paul, who a lot of Celtic fans actually choose you and their greatest of loving. You've you've left a huge impression on us up here. So, as you already know, you're always welcome up at Celtic Park, and it'd be great to see you again once we're allowed to get back together as groups and and do and do such things. Yeah, I mean, thank you for that because it it means so much to me. You know, the Celtic people mean so much to me. But if I'm honest with you, not just Celtic supporters, but their qualities of the human race. Their honour, their love, their generosity, their compassion, their empathy. You know, these are great human qualities that are probably bigger than football. But it just so happens that football is the common denominator that drives us and welds us and keeps us together. So I, I thank 
all the people of Scotland, but inclusive in that is the Celtic supporters of Scotland. And I have to say, quite candidly, I've got many good friends out there who are Rangers people too. And I meet a lot of them here down south. And they're so pleasant. They, they talk to me with the same respect because they're looking at me as a footballer that played in Scotland, but also as a human being. And that's yeah, important. It certainly is. And, and Paul, you're doing some great work uh, in your role at the FA's Inclusion Advisory Board. And um, it's so important from grassroots right up to the highest echelons of society. So I take my hat off to you. All that's left for me to say, Paul, is thank you for your time and thanks for joining me on A Celtic State of Mind. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Neil. My very best to you, your families, and to all the Celtic faithful and, and, and the people in Scotland. I wish you all the best. And you. Take care, Paul. Cheers, Paul. Thanks, mate. 